Good afternoon. Welcome to the program, artist and critic. I'm Don Gray. With us today is the <coughs> very well-known photorealist painter Audrey Flack, and uh, we're very grateful to Audrey for coming. Thanks for coming, Audrey. Um, <coughs> my first question may open kind of a can of worms in in uh, many different ways, but what has been most difficult for you uh, in your life, being a woman or being an artist? What problems have have, have, uh, have they caused you? I'm going to be great. My mind just went completely blank. No, that's all right. What I'm thinking, the reason I asked that was that uh, yeah. I've always personally felt that the artist was kind of a minority figure in many situations, and he certainly isn't too respected in society, if I could speak rather bluntly about it. And women have had a few problems of their own. Yeah, I'm... I'm uh, I was wondering what problems... I want to get right back in there now. ...you've encountered in your life uh, in... in being an artist, being a woman artist, perhaps. Well, you know, they're both loaded. You know, the, the poor old artist, right? as, as we said just in that quick cup of tea before uh, we came here, uh, the artist has a rough time because nobody really wants him in this particular society, even though I feel he's, he, she, and it are necessary for our existence. I mean, I don't see life being too pleasurable without this crazy thing that we call art, you know, without this painting or piece of sculpture or whatever it is that the artist produces. Uh, but it's not a product like a refrigerator or a car that somebody absolutely needs, you know. You don't need the Van Eyck altarpiece, but you do need it, you know, in order to live on this planet. So that there are two kinds of needs and um, it doesn't keep the it rain gets, off, uh, and yet it, or fix flat tires, you can't sleep on the, the great painting, yeah, but we, it su sustains and nourishes so many deeper... Well, basically needs. life. Somewhere, you know, somewhere I've always felt that. Um, but I did get out of Yale, this uh, great rebellious art student, you know, in my black leather jacket and my tight jeans, <laughs> and I couldn't get a job, you know, typical of the art students nowadays. How I did couldn't. You uh, How did you it was difficult. I had. Uh, I, I did eventually get a job, and I got about thirty jobs because I got fired from most of them. I was a, a, a typist. Couldn't type too well. Um, oh, just name it. You know, Who just name it, and I did sales it. Jobs and waiting tables, yeah, everything, and then eventually, your... yeah, supporting my habit. And then I would go on unemployment insurance. It's, it's a, I'm sure, a typical story, you know. This grueling attempt to survive, but it's not as if it's just that, but then you're struggling being an artist, developing your, uh, your painting, because each step is this plunge into the unknown, and, and you never know where you're going to be ending up, even though you may have desires and goals. So it's this two-way struggle, isn't it? You know, Don. How, how uh, did you evolve into a photorealist? Well, I'm just going to say that it's, it's like threefold, because one, there, one, there's a problem of living. You know, there's the actual physical problem of having all of this training, getting out of school, and living, you know, supporting yourself. Two, there's a problem that if you're really um, a serious and if you're going to be an important artist and make that little breakthrough or big breakthrough, which is going to change art history and maybe go a little step further in the world of vision, you're going to be challenging a lot of other people, necessarily, because you're going to just break through. And when you challenge these other people, uh, many of them don't like it, so that you uh, inadvertently, because you're doing this, are going to create some difficult times for yourself. So that's two. And, then, uh, and I would say for myself, that was when I began to use the photograph. Well, All hell strictly, broke loose when I began to use the photograph. Against the artistic establishment of the times, the new academy, in a sense, it was dealing with a strictly formalist, very cold abstraction. How how did you ever surmount that negativism, in a oh, sense, to that was rough. And and just then three was the answer to your first question, and that has to do with being a woman. So that you've got three things going on, uh, and more, I'm sure, you know, we can get to. So it's kind of miraculous that any artist survives, you know, right now. Exactly. Uh, 
Which what, what should has, we attack? Well, what I was thinking of was that you are now successful, uh, quote unquote, whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. You're <clears throat> uh, not only aesthetically with your the work which has developed to a high peak, but also financially in the sense that people are desiring your work now after ignoring you for many years, I'm sure. But <clears throat> what what new pressures or demands? More opportunities have opened to you because of your success now, now that people, now that you're wanted, you're desirable in a sense. Are there problems that success brings in its own due course, that lack of su success has its own special problems? Are there a new set of problems as well as uh, Well, you know, then again you break it down into emotional and artistic. Uh, I just read a two-page article in Vogue by Erica Jung on the uh, trials and tribulations of success, and she sounds quite depressed about it. You know, and she said to to deal with the the fawning adulation, and then the next minute, you know, the attack, the knife in the back, and she said that it's part of human nature to do this. I'm not sure, you know, to attack or to destroy or to uh, uh, be jealous of. Um, Have you encountered that yourself, jealousy and envy? Sure, I've been jealous. Of, God, did I get jealous of Rubens? <laughs> I am so jealous of Rubens. I was Peter just Paul. In, Peter Paul, <laughs> not, not Peter Paul Mads. Mads. No, I know, I thought of that. One. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Mm. Uh, no, but I've been jealous, you know, too. I think we, we're all we're all jealous. Yeah, I've had difficulty. I've had difficulty. I think it's understandable. Um, that's a kind of tacky subject to go into here because it really just gets post uh, personal. You'd uh, rather not explore that aspect of the artistic difficulties because... Well, the, the artistic difficulties are something else. Like, I think now, th those are personal difficulties within your life, you know, that, that you can um, uh, deal with. But the artistic, artistic difficulties can be when you arrive at a style, you know, and your dealer says, hey, you know, I can sell this, you know, let's have 20 more of these. Oh, uh, I can sell 30 small ones and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few museums want a few big ones and you start knocking out. Uh, that's the thing you have to really watch out for because uh, Keeping in mind what it's all about and the fact that we live once and we've got a certain amount of time on this earth. And if you want to be an artist, I, I can't believe that artists go into it to make money. Otherwise, they'd go down to Wall Street. I mean, it's a very nice side effect. Uh, but it's very easy to get caught up in this kind of thing. Of course, I think we were uh, talking before, a lot of artists willingly get caught up in this uh, repetition of a formula just to make money that they become sort of public performers in a predictable style. How, how are you avoiding this danger? Uh, it, it's, it's a very real danger and every artist who is desirable confronts it and must face it and solve it somehow to keep their creativity alive and make their life meaningful as you say. How, yeah. how have you fought this? You know I think I, I think I can't help it. You know it's like when I was at Cooper Union I can't help it. I, I won't do it. I never have and I never will. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I have a terrific dealer, you know, Louis Mizell. Uh, I, I really respect him. He's never tried to tell me what to paint, as many dealers do. Right. Um, but I, you know, <laughs> Louis says, hey, how about a few small ones, Audrey? Well, I'm making big paintings now. I've got the energy and I've got the, uh, I'm seeing big. Yeah. And I've got to do it now, because right. next year, I don't know, I might not be here. Um, well, you're an artist of, of great integrity, and... Uh, uh, it sounds and corny, but... No, not at know, all. I, I was thinking, I, when I, I was really in, like to hear this. When I was in Cooper Union, Don, I was in... A, uh, my class was the class with Milton Glaser right. and Seymour Quast, the whole New York Magazine crew. And I was the only painter, painter. But when that group was forming, which was in my class, in, you know, in that period of time, I was kind of, I was in that circle, my roommate went out with Milton, and, you know, but it was, in, it was just a known fact, I was the painter, you know, they all talked about, hello, fly. A little um, bit of living, living matter floating around here. 
they all talked about painting someday, but it, it, was, it was so clear, and I'm sure you've come across this. Uh, there's a mentality that, talks that about stamps it. you, you know, and, and uh, they were going to make it. There was no doubt in the way that they did. You know, they opened Pushpin, and then they went on to New York, and they did terrific things in a certain way, and I was... In sort of a fashionably <laughs> acceptable way, if we might say. Yes, that, yes, and monetarily acceptable yeah, way. Yeah. You know. well, well, that's always the easy way, and, and you think of that type of person, at least I do, as basically the academic of his time. You know, they may be clothed in avant-garde clothing in the sense that they're very abstractly formal and no hint of reality at all. We think of realism as being the academic schools of the past, but it's flip-flopped in our time, hasn't it? The abstract formalist has become the uh, academic of our time, the established order and the person who maybe is doing something else uh, a little closely, more closely related to nature is the, might truly eventually become the considered the avant-garde. Would you think, or am I pushing oh, it too yeah, far? Oh, you're, yeah, you're, you're dealing with so many things. Really? You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a whole lot of things. Well, okay. I, I sort I, of I, have to be careful, because acad yeah, the academy so. means so much. Like, I'm very involved in the 19th century academy right now. Yeah, so, well, um, what the word academy means well, and I, I who's think, academic. I think of academy as, as those people who oftentimes get locked into uh, their acceptable formulas of the time in a sense. You know, the way the, uh, I'm just thinking of, say, the way Barnett, Newman, Ellsworth, Kelly, to mention a few names, got locked into this abstract formalist kind of thing. And it became the do or die god of the moment. and. If you are, were realistically inclined, uh, you would be looked at as kind of an outsider who would have a very difficult time countering the effect of this established art. And pretty soon it sort of calcifies, doesn't it, and goes dead, the established art, and it has to be overthrown in a way. And isn't that sort of what you Yeah, the you know, I guess going? I was just questioning the use of the word academy is all. I yeah. think I might use the word establishment then. Okay. Maybe you're using the word establishment. Sure. I'm when I was a realist, when I was a realist, which started in 1951, That's early. I was I was That's an, early. I was an abstract expressionist. You know, I knew Pollock and Klein and de Kooning and the stories of what happened to the women or being a female in those days are really rough. Um, Why? Because the abstract expressionists were he-man lover types. Uh, well, that the I mean, these, these poor guys were so involved in their macho image. Mm -hmm. That look what happened to them. I think, you know, I really do feel Act, sorry. Car accidents and drinking. Car themselves. accident, Did suicide. Yeah. You know, drinking. Essentially, that's uh, what it was. I drinking guess. oneself to death, yeah. right? They either all died, they were all alcoholics. You know, Roscoe slit his wrists. Uh, but I think part of it, well, it, it's more complicated. Certainly part of it was to keep up a certain kind of macho image. And the women were like groupies. Hanging they, around, uh, and hanging around, and you know, if they could just get a, a look, it was very hard to be a really serious, independent female artist and be taken seriously at that time. Um, it took a certain amount of guts, and uh, but that what what you're saying, just to go on, is that became the establishment. That kind of art, right. and whatever was really popular, you had to do that. And if you were a realist in those days. Yeah. Forget um, it. Forget it. Forget it. Right. Exactly. And it's been that way for so many years. And certainly Audrey Flack is one of those who is changing the situation, bringing a little bit more feeling of reality into art that really is essentially very unreal and in many cases very artificial. Perhaps we can start looking at some of uh, Audrey Flack's paintings, beginning with this early uh, portrait of President Kennedy, is this the uh, fatal motorcade, Audrey, or we can say, oh, yeah. ask what is the uh, that's inspiration the, of this? That's the Kennedy motorcade. It was November 22nd, I think it was 1963. Right. Um, five minutes before he was shot, he's riding along, uh, and his chest, poor thing, is totally all- Totally vulnerable. Totally vulnerable. There's Connolly, kind of In staring. Straight ahead with his fixing his tie, but I, it, in all the photographs I looked at, my feeling was that Connolly 
knew something. That's, sensed it, you mean? I either sensed it or being from Dallas, he knew what was going to happen. That's, that's my feeling. I have no facts to base it on. This is just visual dynamics of looking at a lot of pictures, looking at Kennedy's face, looking at Jackie's face. You know, they obviously don't know. And look at Connolly. Uh, there's the FBI man that jumped out of the car to get Jackie. Um, at uh, any rate, what? Are, are you working, uh, you're working from artistic intuition, but are you saying that there was a, a conspiracy here that Connolly was aware of, or that just he's uneasy because of the atmosphere? I think they, the I time? think that somebody sure. is about realism, because, uh, and working from photographs. Uh, I had never seen Kennedy personally, and yet I was so deeply moved and so upset about his death that I wanted yeah. to express it, uh, and I had to work from photographs. I mean, his head was blown off exactly. at that point. Exactly. I couldn't even, I, you know, even if I wanted to go to the morgue to look at him, I, all I'd see was some gore. Yeah. I, yeah. It was interesting. These are two women grieving outside of a Dallas hospital while he was inside. You know, Kennedy meant a great deal to so many, to all so levels, many of us. Yes, yeah, so many artists, and not the yeah. only one. Yeah. Lou Pollock, who had the Peridot Gallery, uh, was going to put on a Kennedy show of uh, many artists that had painted, uh, painted, painted and sculpted. Had, uh, done some. Yeah, uh, when, when after he was shot, you know, that had been moved oh, by oh, this. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, for some yeah. reason, the exhibition was stopped or canceled, or there was some political thing, and then Lou died. Well, there's certainly been a number of strange, strange uh, incidents in connected with uh, Kennedy's life and tragic death. And I, I recall that we were, to uh, be perfectly frank, I, I was not a Kennedy admirer, but I was in somewhat of a state of shock for about four days oh, yes. after, glued to the television set, as so many of us were, you know, watching that tragic motorcade with the horse and the train journey and all. It, it's unforgettable in uh, our own personal lives in American history. Audrey, who, who are these? Uh, well, uh, the, we just have concluded with all of my political paintings. Oh, we have. Two. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, there are there are many, many more, but there was a whole time when I did political paintings, and, and now we're just jumping, obviously. And, and we're also it, changing style from two pictures that were a little bit rougher, and moving to some that are right, right. Well, we're the, moving from two pictures that were done from color, one from a color print, and the other one from a black and white print to one which was done from a slide, a slide projection. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I projected a slide. You, now, you projected it on the canvas? By the way, the, the, the frame is painted. And unfortunately, every time it's reproduced, they, they remove the frame because they don't think that it was painted, and they think that they're doing me a favor, and I get very upset. It is painted. It's yeah, part of the, it's, it's top you know, and, yeah. and fortunately, it, you know, it, it works so that people don't think that it's painted. Uh, at any rate, this is Oriol Farb. She um, was the director of the Riverside Museum, oh, yeah. and she commissioned this portrait of her family. How, 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 how did you come, well, l let me put it this way. How can one project a slide on a canvas? Is that what you're saying you did? Yeah, well, and then what, how can what you happened? It, uh, at, with uh -huh. the light down and, and all this. What's that, that takes another interview, but I'll tell you how it started. <laughs> um, I, I got the portrait commission. She was a very important, supportive force in my career, mm. a beautiful woman. When mm. I was, I guess in every artist's life, you have to have certain Somebody, people yeah. that, that believe in you in mm. times that are pretty desperate, I, I guess. Um, and she did. She did many, many things. Um, but I, I got the commission. I went, I dressed them. Uh, she's wearing a, a pink dress. And somewhere in her calm serenity balances the three men, as she does in life. Uh, but I had sketched it in. You know, I was working from sketching with my charcoal on the canvas. Uh, I've taught anatomy, by the way, and I can draw quite well. And I had it halfway done, I thought, there must be something that can speed this up a little bit, you know? I, it was 10.30 at night, and I had an idea, what about if I project it, you know, just to register it, just to get the sizes? 
I uh, called up a friend who lived around the corner on 103rd Street, and uh, I said, do you have a projector? And I ran over, I got the projector. I remember projecting the image on over my drawing, right? And I was within, oh, an eighth or a sixteenth yeah. of an inch, which yeah. is pretty good. Yeah, pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, except it was just so much faster yeah. for me to, yeah. to get yeah, that yeah, right yeah. in there, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's how it started. And it changed my entire vision, expanded it, and I can't begin to tell you what it did to color. Now, are you projecting the slide all the time you're painting or just for the preliminary drawing? At or first, at first, it was a drawing aid. And then I began to look at what happened. Uh, oh, that's the mic. I can't remove that. That's OK. I began to uh, get interested in what was happening in terms of color because you're projecting. Uh, all it is is a light, you know, a strong halogen bulb. Yeah, exactly. And you put a slide, a gelatin slide, and this light goes through the slide. And miraculously, you've got all this color. So I began studying that and studying how the three color process works. I wasn't using an airbrush then, by the way. Uh, what, 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 what puzzles me is how a person can draw from a slide when one's arm is between the camera and the canvas. I mean, how, how does your own shadow? You step out of the way. You step outside. You step so. out of the way. You uh, step in front of the projector to see what you've got. You, you learn. You mm -hmm. adjust. Yes. It took about yes. a year for me to adjust to color. Oh, my goodness, the difference between, for instance, airbrush color and painted color. I mean, you can mix cadmium red light, let's mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. or any color, but when you take cadmium red light, paint it on and spray it on, and you wouldn't believe it's the same color. But is there a greater intensity or purity, or can you describe? No, the... what it has to do with is light, you see. But that's another thing, because I don't believe in color anymore. I think that color is only reflections of light off of a surface. You mean the rougher paint surface will refract it in a different no, way? No, because it up? spraying is not necessarily rougher. No, I mean the brushwork would be rougher and the spraying might be smoother, the, is what I was. Well, you, but it would, it would equally apply to a, a smoothly applied mm. paint. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not an airbrush man myself, and frankly, I don't know that much about airbrush, and so I have to ask you, perhaps in relation to uh, Michelangelo's. David here, your painting of the, st of the statue. Uh, how, 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 what, what does the airbrush do, and, and what is it in terms of technique? Is it, is it air blown? I mean, is I'm sorry, it, Don, but this is not airbrush. Oh, this is an airbrush. <laughs> Painted with a little brush, but we'll get to some We're, airbrush oh, you, ones. Okay, you haven't reached airbrush. At I have this not stage. reached okay. airbrush I'll, at this I'll stage. I've but, reached slides. Okay. You know, this is okay. a slide I took. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to do here, by the way. It's more interesting, I think, in terms of subject matter. Uh, because I got involved with objects that had been previously called kitsch, you know, like objects that I felt had been demeaned. Uh, you've seen you mean so you've many reproductions. So of it, many reproductions. Just, you've mm. seen David. I've seen that poor David's head, a plant in it. Mm. You know, the head, they cut off the top <laughs> and a plant grows out of the it. The ultimate you know. insult there. On, on, on tablecloths, right, <laughs> right. Or these little uh, yeah. wax yeah. Uh, statues, you know, anatomically terrible. Yeah, exactly. And, and yet, um, my feeling was that the people need this image so badly. Yeah. What the humanism of it? More or less, There's or? Much, there was something great about mm. this figure, <laughs> putting it mildly. Yeah, right, but there's right. something which has attracted and has great meaning. I think it's humanism, by the way. I think he's a gentle, heroic male, not, not a violent male, even though he mm. has killed Goliath. And uh, I think people need it and want it and reproduce that image for themselves. And what I wanted to do is also that, but elevate it to the level of art. So it's a combination of, of using something that was kitsch. And by the way, I used this statue and not the one in the academy mm. quite intentionally. Mm. Mm. This is a statue people see. This is the one that's weather beaten, right. you know, with the streaks yeah. coming down his face. This is the one that when you sit in the Piazza Signoria, that's the David, mm. you know, rather than the pure rarefied one. Because I'm involved in art which reaches people. I well, care much about it. You know, you really are uh, speaking toward our, our own time, which I, I feel has uh, 
relegated our humanity to a far, far, far it's been far removed and we're more impressed with technological developments and uh, commercial aspects. And I think people have gotten lost in the shuffle in our time. Yes. You know, and I, yes. I feel like you're, you're speaking toward this lost uh, sense of humanity and warmth and... Uh, yes, and people need art and, and want to understand art and need art for their lives. And I think when, uh, I think they haven't been considered. You know, I think it has gotten kind of elitist and removed and... Uh, cold and impersonal and... Yeah, as a lot of photorealism has been called, cold, impersonal, distant. I mean, those have been great words. Cool, cool. that's a terrific, mm -hmm. cool man, mm -hmm. that's a terrific word. Something warm or hot or emotional, like this lady here. Uh, what, what, what is, is this, Audrey? What, uh... This is a, a painting of a polychrome statue uh, that's life-size called the Macarena Esperanza. And the statue, she is the patron saint of Seville. Mm. I call her Natalie Wood. She looks a little like yeah. Natalie Wood to me. She does now that you mention um, it. She is the statue that's paraded around Seville during Holy Week, you know, with millions of candles, and they pin money on her, and they pin jewels and lace, and she has a gold crown and emeralds. And the people adore her. They worship her. I came across this statue in Seville several years ago, and I was so awestruck. It's truly great, Don. It's a truly great work of art. You know? Very moving too, I would imagine. Very moving, and the sculpture and the polychrome, it's a great work of art. It was done in the 17th century. I was so struck that I went around the church looking for someone to ask, perhaps they would know who painted it, uh, who sculpted it. Right, right. And I found a little Spanish guide who said, La Roldana, and I've had enough high school Spanish to know that La means the... Was, no, it was feminine. Oh, it was? It was feminine. And I said, la, you know. <laughs> and he said, Luis Toroldan. And I nearly fainted there, then on the church floor, because it was done by a woman in the Fantastic. 17th century. Which, uh, and I have I have researched her right. since, and she's a very great artist. Audrey, I can't believe it, but uh, our time has fled, and uh, we're at the end of the program. Did we ever reach, was the Virgin of Hope, was she... Uh, Macarena Esperanza, was she airbrushed or did we She was airbrushed. <laughs> we reached airbrushed. Okay. Uh, we, okay. We've gotten up to, by the way, 1970, 1970. in my work. So, okay. so we, we really haven't dealt with any of the recent work okay. or, the, well, or the painting that the modern got. Well, we're gonna, we'll have you back, okay? And, and continue this sure. in, a, in a month or so or the next time that there is an opening. I'm so sorry we have to leave Audrey Flack at this time. She's been a wonderful guest and obviously a very warm human being, as I'm sure you've seen this afternoon. The show is Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks very much for being with us. Bye-bye.